Oh, Today man. on Podcast Some Downs, TOS Rewatch. It's what are little girls made of? A.K.A. the Forbidden Planet, again. I'm Tim Regan from U.S. power metal band Burning Shadows. Uh, Metallica tribute band Fade to Black. Dual violin folk metal band Eisenmore. And recently vacated graves True Zombie Metal. You're listening to Podcast of Down. Can you please change the intro to I'm Tim Regan? <laughs> Oh, what is it? Is it Tim? Is it this is Tim Regan? <laughs> this is Tim Regan, but I just like I'm. T- <laughs> so what we need to do is I need to be your announcer anytime I'm on the show. I like it. I like and, it. Yeah. Yes. Live from Baltimore, it's Tim Regan. Tim. And then you go, I'm Tim Regan. <laughs> Here's your producer, oh. Tim Regan. <laughs> okay, so. Who's... All right, we're recording. Okay. Yeah, we are. <laughs> all right. Okay. Who's got the thing? This is all going in there. All right, so now we're doing a non-five-minute Star Trek review, uh, as you may have heard from the last Star Trek review. Yeah, that was that was minutes. stressful. And I, was, I, I, I wasn't even talking. I was just watching I, the time. <laughs> I know. I, I, I'm frankly still a little flustered from our previous uh, review, and that was literally at least a week ago, possibly longer. Um, so, uh, so as you recall, Doug, uh, this is our our seventh released original series episode. Uh, a notable episode. What are little girls made of? Terrible title. The, really, really terrible title. See, when I when we were talking about doing an episode in five minutes, <laughs> I thought it was going to be this one, but based on the title alone, because uh, neither of them are good. Mud's women, or um, what what little girls are made of, but uh, the latter <laughs> is creepy. Yeah, and and you know, having watched this episode. I can't really explain to you why it has this title. You know, uh, some of the titles make sense, um, but a lot of titles don't. Um, even to the point where there's nothing um, in the script to give us a clue. Um, it's It's just... It's just a, a puzzle. It's a puzzle of a puzzle. Um, so where do we where do we begin? Um, I guess in the in the teaser is where we begin, right? So already we've come up with the problem of uh, the wayward scientist discovering a previously unknown civilization. If you remember, that was the premise of the man trap, and we're just going to do it all again (laughs) uh, and practically just do another take on that episode in this episode. So the the Enterprise is going to XO4. Um, I guess it it might even be another, like, required uh, Starfleet medical checkup, possibly. Um, And uh, we uh, are trying to find... Uh, this guy, Dr. Roger Corby, um, and we do meet a new character that I don't believe we've met yet, but that's nurse uh, Christine Chapel is on the bridge. Uh, and she, as it turns out, was the fiance of Dr. Corby. Uh, and, and she actually left to pursue her career in Starfleet Medical uh, because uh, good, old, good old Raj Corby was going to explore the frozen wastes of XO3. Wait, wait, but are they still engaged? Uh, I don't think so. Well, but not not to not to jump ahead, but uh so what's her big problem then? <laughs> I think it's like they're not 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 engaged. I I feel like it was like uh let's like take a break while you're on your 
planetary expedition. So this could be the prototypical Friends episode when Ross kept going, we're on a break. Yeah, we're in, on in a fact, break. It, it was entirely based on, on this episode uh, for reasons we'll see. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so uh, they make... You know, they, they, it's this ice planet. Um, they're worried. They haven't heard from Dr. Corby. Um, they're not sure if he's alive. Um, but they learn from a transmission, despite the odds, he's alive. He and at least a few of members of his expedition um, have taken refuge in the ruins of an underground civilization. Right. Um, it, I I don't know if you... I might not have been paying attention, but Planet XO3 is very, mm -hmm. very cold. If it's not obvious, I actually watched this episode. I, this might be the first one I watched all the way through in our rewatch <laughs> series. So this is my You should my keep watch. pointing things out to demonstrate that you watched it. Yeah, I, re I really like this. Uh, I really like this. Uh, I don't know uh, if you guys noticed, but the frozen sounding planet was frozen. The blue <laughs> stuff was. Wasn't it cool when she wore that blue well, shirt? Well, I'm bringing it up now so I can bring it up later. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Good point. So, and th and that's the teaser. I mean, we just learned that that he's alive down there, um, teasing us that uh, that he's alive. That so, crunch. Doug, want to kick off the scores? <laughs> well, this is the. I I think. The chapel does appear in at least the naked time, right? Because oh, that's a, right. You know what? That's right. Because uh, she's in love with Spock. I believe you're right. Yeah, but I, it, this is probably the first and only Nurse Chapel kind of character episode. <laughs> yeah. Uh, metal score. I mean, we've seen this, this same thing, like four times by now. I don't know. There's not much suspense. Dr. Corby, uh, I mean, it's just the forbidden planet again, or, and the naked, uh, or, uh, uh, the man trap. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, we do learn about underground caverns. It's not that interesting. I go to three on the quality right. score. Okay. Is that a 10, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All we do and is metal. score things, and I already forgot how to score things. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, we do the Olympics one time. So that was... Uh, what score doctor. was that? Was that quality? That was quality. Yeah, that was, was a quality. So, so Dr. Corby comes from the pastor... The pastor of archaeological archaeological medicine. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> his translation of medical records from the Orion ruins revolutionized our immunization techniques. That's true. He's also a creep, though, because according to this uh, uh, Christine Chapel memory al uh, alpha entry. Um, Dr. Corby was definitely her professor. Ah. Uh, yeah. Bump and they were bow, engaged. Bow. Yeah. Uh, so on the metal, I mean, it's a frozen planet. Um, you know, the, the expectation and disappointment, that's pretty metal. Uh, uh, two. Two. All right. Uh, I'm going to give this a... Um, yeah, I think you're right. I, it's it's Everything is low. Uh, I'm going to give both the metal score and the quality score is 2.5. Um, as teasers go, like I like the teasers that just jump into the action versus just jumping into the inaction. Um, and again, from this teaser... If if it was 1966 and I saw that teaser, I uh, I'd, I'd probably like go to the store and buy some cigarettes or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, and even all right. So we interact one, and even even the captain's log is kind of disappointing. It doesn't say anything that we didn't already know. Uh, just real quick, my score is three and three. All right, go. Oh, ahead. oh. <laughs> I apologize. Let me. Uh, I apologize to you, Tim. That's, That's on me. Awkward. Jump the gun. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you're so it's it's because we did that fast episode and you, yeah it's just man you know you got to keep it moving Doug, i hope to... you're not i hope you don't stand near a precarious abyss when tim's around you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> a joke we all get once for once yeah <laughs> oh, that's good. all right so we're gonna captain's log doesn't say anything new got yeah. a let down all the action of that <laughs> teaser, we needed a reset. They don't slip anything in there. Yeah, it just proves the whole thing could have been done in a sentence or two. Yeah, yep. all right, so, so Corby makes that weird request about Kirk coming down alone. Oh, that's the other thing. Yeah, they don't tie, so Chapel doesn't speak to Corby until after the teaser. Right. Uh, all right. I'll just take that out of my score here. That's not okay. Yeah, I mean, in in Dr. Corby's defense, he has no idea that um, Christine Chapel's on the Enterprise. All, all he knows is that he disappeared five years ago and his fiance just kind of disappeared as well. You know, like, the, the plot is he disappeared and Christine Chapel's like, well, I guess we're broken up. Now that my fiance is gone, missing on the planet of XO3. Um, so she's like concerned, but not all that concerned. Memory Alpha specifically says that she is his former fiance. Right. But, but uh, Memory Alpha also says that following her fiance's disappearance on the planet XO3, right, so she abandoned fair. a career in bio research for a position in Starfleet in the hopes that a deep space assignment would one day reunite her with Corby, which seems like the worst thing. Like, that's the worst plan if a loved one disappears. It's like, well, <laughs> my fiance is lost at sea, so I'm going to join a submarine force in the hope of one day making it to that place where she went. Okay, fair. Fair. I mean, it's not like I'm going to lead the rescue mission. <laughs> it's like, I'm sure we'll wind up there five years later. It's just space. I mean, yeah. we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> right. It's like, you know, I mean, yeah. Not even like the Atlantic and the Pacific. There's no landmass in between scooting across. Um, all right. So, yeah. And I guess Chapel not speaking to him. The teaser makes sense because this is this is all a business discussion initially. Yeah. Yeah. Kirk and Corby. Then they just have a minute to slip, a, you know, one line to slip in the personal thing after the business discussion concludes. Then weird Spock Chapel tension yeah. just for a second. And only the, the tiniest little moment. <laughs> um, and then they beam down. Okay, so um, they beam down to uh -huh. an ice planet where it's like negative 100, I think they yep. say at one point. Uh, and they're at the entrance of the cave. Mm -hmm. But apparently the cave is so hot that they don't need jackets. Nope. Their breath doesn't come out in clouds. Oh, no, true. They, they are perfectly comfortable at the entrance to the cave, which you, you, you would imagine would be cold as fuck. And again, you know, there's lots of questions here. I mean, Doug and I are big fans of field jackets, so I feel like that I would be a just going to go there. That would be a perfect opportunity to wear a Starfleet field jacket. Um, that that seems much more. It seems to make a lot more sense to wear that than when beaming down to the climate-controlled regular one space laboratory, for example. Um, but <laughs> also, I, I think another strange thing that I don't quite understand, uh, and this is a recurring Star Trek problem, you have the ability to beam miles into a planet's surface, right? So why do you 
beam to the entrance of the cave. I mean, like usually, if at, by next generation time they would say something like the tribarlodite crystals are interfering with the with the transporter signal, so we're gonna have to beam you to the entrance of the cave, or like uh, uh, the crystalline entity can't read past the thormagracine deposits. So we'll be safe here. But there's none of that bullshit. They're just like, uh, I guess even though we've been to you hundreds, if not thousands of miles away from where the ship is, we'll just leave you like 10 meters, 20 meters away from where you actually need to be. I also like how the cave, uh, it's clearly a natural cave. Except for all the perfect doorways that they <laughs> carved in. Nice uh, rectangular doorways that are too low for the inhabitants of the planet, which we'll find out later. I mean, I imagine that the the, the ancient civilization did that. Um, so, uh, despite the fact being told to beam down alone, uh, Kirk <laughs> beams down with not only Nurse Christine Chapel as kind of like a surprise to our buddy uh, Dr. Corby, but also two security guards. Security um, men. Security men. Well, I uh, security guards. I mean, come on. Who's going to be security, Doug? Uh, chick. Um, <laughs> this is the future. <laughs> yeah, they don't. You're right. It's all sick. Well, they don't get back to that for another yeah. little bit. Yeah, we're the the the, tw the 2260s were a very misogynistic uh, time. This is know. just like the 1950s. Yeah. yeah. It's the neo-misogynist era, uh, in fact. Um, okay, so, uh, again, and a great point to Tim's point, one of them is just left in front of the freezing cold, like, negative 100-degree <laughs> cave entry, and he's like, stay there, um, other guy, and we're going to go down and see uh, what's going on. But I um, think, Matt, I'll just speak for both of us. When, when we get the rights from Kurtzman... Or do our own Star Trek f fan films. Anytime they do any kind of uh, excursion ashore, they are going to be wearing proper oh, field coats, coats. Uh, a climate and uh, uh, appropriate and fully kitted and provisioned for whatever you would need in that environment. We're going to correct this. Yeah, uh, and I would like to have seen uh, Rayburn, who's the guy... He's left at the thing, like maybe like take out a, a space phone and play like base. <laughs> uh, what's that game? Uh, uh, Quantum Gemeralds or, you know, it's, it's some game that everyone plays, uh, you know, just entertain himself. Watch some watch some holographic porn on his communicator or something, you know, <laughs> something like <"Broop." laughs> like and there's like a shot back at him like. Ah, you know, just like give me a. I I don't want to believe that poor Rayburn. Well, I mean, we know what happens to him, but like, is it, are his potentially final moments just stood standing ramrod straight in front of a freezing do cold cave entrance? Like, I have to believe he did something more endearing. I I don't well, know. He maintained I, post until the end. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I can buy that if he's like a space marine, but if but is he? I th he's more likely a space sailor, in which case yeah. he would definitely be looking at uh, space porn. <laughs> space porn. I mean, and or drinking. Spoiler alert! Just because this poor guy gets his skull bashed in by something, it doesn't mean that he couldn't enjoy his last moments. Uh, anyway, so they're walking, and uh, of, again, it's another advanced civilization that seems to have missed. You know, the Aztecs didn't have the wheels. Uh, or like advanced like iron technology, uh, and this civilization didn't invent the railing. Um, so there's <laughs> there's a lit. It's called a literal bottomless cavern uh, with no railing uh, or even a warning sign. Um, and uh, as they're walking down their way, uh, the security guard just seems to to die. He <laughs> just seems to. All down the cliff, mysterious like, um, and uh, uh, and at the bottom of the the little path, um, they they find Doctor Corby and his buddy Doctor Brown, um, and they're like, "Our bad about that 
<laughs> bottomless pit. You should have beamed in where we told you to. And I told you not to bring anybody else. Like, if you don't follow instructions, like, motherfuckers are going to fall down bottomless caverns. But Kirk, being the good captain he is, uh, is there any chance of a projection or a wedge? <laughs> yep, that's right. <laughs> he won't let go. Maybe he's just hanging on by one tiny face finger. Um, <laughs> but they say no. Uh, it's uh, it's all it's all uh, terribly unfortunate. All terribly unfortunate. But he's dead. No need to look for him. So lunch, right? Yeah. So then they go in and have lunch, uh, and uh, they they learn that like a previous civilization made this underground sanctuary when their sun went dark, which is weird because the there was clearly light <laughs> outside the cavern. Well, um, maybe it went relatively dark. Okay, that's true. Maybe it's just like kind of dark, darker. Yeah. Okay, that's 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 good. Um. And they meet a uh, uh, beautiful Andrea who's dressed inappropriately, uh, but it's the uh, misogynistic 2260s, so that's okay. Um, and uh, uh, old Christine Chapel's a little uh, suspicious of Andrea because why is her fiance hanging out with this uh, with this sexy young sexy young thing? Um, she knows what he's like around. Women significantly younger than him, uh, you know. So, so she is rightly concerned. And it's essentially the same setup as the Doctor Morbius of the Forbidden Planet with his daughter. Yep, different outcome, but yeah. Which, uh, which came first? Actually, is Forbidden Planet before this episode? Yeah, it was a uh, fifty-five, fifty-three, fifty-six. Okay, okay. Uh, so, so basically, there's just a bunch of suspicious shit going on. Um, uh, Corby says, don't contact your ship. And Kirk says, I can't do that. Like, literally one person is already dead. And I can't talk to the guy um, that I left at the entrance of the cave for some reason. Yeah, I like how um, the guy falls down the bottomless pit and he doesn't, <laughs> doesn't bother yeah, doesn't... to tell anyone. He's like... Hmm, well, we'll deal with that later. Well, yeah, I'll check in later. <laughs> um, so, uh, basically, very soon thereafter, the whole jig is up. Um, Brown threatens Kirk with a laser pistol. There's a brief struggle. Uh, and it turns out that our buddy, Dr. Brown, is in fact a goddamn android. And not <gasps> only that, but for some reason, there's a huge wrestler ridiculous guy who barges in the room and lifts Kirk up like a rag doll and we're all very confused. And that's the end of act 2. The uh the the giant dude. His makeup reminds me of Nergal from Behemoth. Mm, mm -hmm. You know, if it was black and white, <laughs> he could totally be in a black metal band. I mean, he has a very black metal appearance, I believe. Like, even his, like, uh, vampiric, like, hood collar thing. Like, he's a little too, like, 60s pastel colored. Um, but you just change some of those colors, and I am sure that yeah, he's, well, like... I, I, I watch this in, you know, I'm, when I watch these, <laughs> it's the, uh, the redone new versions you know where they uh took the film so it's all hd and uh i'm sure it looked fine on 60s tvs but like you know in hd you can very clearly see the makeup and yeah. uh, and the bald cap and stuff you yeah, mean that, the that actor definitely had hair you mean the fact that no one bothered to do anything to his neck <laughs> It's just like, well, that's good enough. It's it's 1966. What's what's he gonna see? Um, all right, so so let's get some scores. That's Act One. Woo! Uh, I like the metal vampire guy. Uh, <laughs> I like the uh, careless disregard for someone's death. That's pretty metal. So I'm gonna give it a metal score of 6.66. Quality right. score. 
Uh, the android was a nice reveal. The the guy being a robot. So uh, I'm gonna go with um with seven. No seven. No six and a half. Six point five. Yeah, I I agree. I I feel like the beginning of the structure of the first half of the act is a little strange. Uh, but it gets much better in the second half. Um, the reveals are good. Um, the stra- I, There is like, do we see, I forget, when someone dies, it's the first security guy or the second security guy. There's almost like a comic appearance of, of the giant bald guy just like knocking them over or like hitting them on the head or something. Which is- with, like, with like a giant mallet. Yeah, yeah. So it's like that was a little comedic. It's like too comedic. A little lump grows out of his head. I'm gonna give it a five point five uh, quality score, and the metal score is a six. I mean, th- there's lots of the reveals are metal. Um, the the casual disinterest. You're right. The casual disinterest about the death of of underlings is metal. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. And the costumes are pretty metal. Costumes are across the metal. board. Uh, yeah, and the whole notion of a bottomless cavern, the whole bottomless thing never being challenged. <laughs> yeah, just like <laughs> taken as a literal fact. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to go with a six and a six. Six and six, all right. Okay. What happens next? I don't even remember. Uh, the problem with this episode for me, and and maybe this is now a good time to point it out, um, the first act starts off so well and really gets you into an interesting place, um, but then it just kind of like, and a lot of these original series episodes do that, um, there's a whole lot of like sitting around and like just letting things happen. Um, and I think it just reflects like a different sense of like dramatic tension. Uh, but it's just like, well, that's your plan? Like, why aren't you doing anything? Um, so it begins uh, with uh, Kirk supposedly calling Spock and telling him everything is okay. Um, but we learn that it's actually the android, Rook, uh, mimicking uh, Captain Kirk's voice. Um, so he says, everything's fine. And just, uh, you know, keep keep on doing. Everything's great down here. And that's, you know, that's the way it is. How, um, how great then, was that actor, though? Because they got the sync, the, the timing perfect. Yeah, I mean, imagine how hard those additions are. Not only do you have to be like six foot nine uh, and 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 cock diesel but you also have to be able to do incredible <laughs> impressions and and that was not even the most impressive that will <laughs> all right that that guy's name was ted cassidy man i wonder if he's related uh, to jack cassidy i hope so i hope it's his son or his dad dad <laughs> <laughs> So then there's like some like dicking around with Dr. Corby. Um, he is best like, known for portraying Lurch on the Adams family. Oh, uh, wow. So he's like just like a, a big guy character actor. That's yeah. what he does. Yeah. Wow. Huh. Oh, he's also the voice of the puppet, apparently. Um, in uh, in the Corbomite maneuver, which we'll talk about um, later, twenty twenty two, yeah. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. So uh, 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 he, um, you know, he's just palling around. Doctor Corby says, "Yeah, there's these goddamn androids." Um, <laughs> uh, Kirk finally remembers to ask what happened to Rayburn, the guy at the cavern. And Corby's like, yeah, we killed them, <laughs> but I told you not to bring people. And I asked Rook not to, um, but you know, when Rook gets angry, he kills people. Oh, um, he also has, uh, Rook imitate other voices and, uh, Rook imitates nurse chapel um and he he orders rook never to mock or harm chapel um and that he needs to obey all of chapel's commands 
um, which is part of Captain Kirk's plot um, because he's he's trying to escape, um, but rather clumsily, and and Kirk gets. <laughs> Like there are very there's several scenes in which William Shatner is just picked up and thrown across the room, <laughs> at which point in reality it seems like he should just be broken into several pieces. But he's all right, he's fine. Uh, you can throw him against a cardboard wall and he's good to go again. Um, d- despite the fact that should break his neck, right? Um, so I mean, there's just more sitting around. There's more eating. Um, yeah, they were they were eating. Various colors of polygons. <laughs> yeah, uh, again, we've seen these colored polygons before. Um, uh, he he orders creepily Andrea to kiss Kirk, um, and then to slap him across. It's just it's just a weird episode. Uh, this is a weird act, um, and it's sort of. Just it's just uncomfortable. It's weird. It's like, why is this happening? It's exposition dump, but it's also just it, it just feels gross. Like it it feels inappropriate. Like the whole act feels inappropriate. And then we end with the most inappropriate um thing of all, um, which is Kirk disappears. And Chapel is led by Corby to his laboratory, where conveniently we find a naked Captain Kirk uh, tied into uh, like a tied into a merry-go-round, and there's like a blank uh, jelly human thing, like a blank android, and he's like, "Now I'm going to show you how androids are made." Um, and and the so it's like a rotating platform, and there is naked Kirk. And uh, yeah, you, you spin just... you spin your human and your blank android. Yeah, and you what? So you spin them away from each other because they're right. on either sides of this thing, and somehow, <laughs> somehow the android uh, blank uh, gets uh, duplicate uh, a human duplication. But we're gonna learn about that in the next act because that's actually Act Three. So this is just, that's the end of this creepy act, the big reveal of naked uh, Kirk. Uh, and You yeah. are correct. Yeah. Well, but, it, but it does end on a metal note, though. Naked bondage Kirk? Yeah. Okay. That's and then when the, the robot girl slaps Kirk, that's pretty metal. Okay. And there's... Uh, be- Right before all this is the big overture that it's revealed that Andrea, too, is an android. And he's like, we have no feelings. She, she's just a robot. Which, you know, a, a guy in a cave for five years is going to build a fuckbot. Of course he is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course he is. A strange feeling. I've heard that somewhere before. I don't know what you're talking about. All right, so yeah. act two. <laughs> act two. Yeah, Go ahead, Doug. Obedience and disobedience stuff in the dialogue. It's really like S and M kind of stuff here, which yeah. could be metal. I mean, let's let's just generally speaking, I'd say yeah. yes. Yeah. And it's to Tim. Let's do it a quick interlude. So the author of this episode is Robert Blank. Block. Who is fa- is part of the post the second generation of Lovecraft writers, right? That's right. Oh he, yeah. He also wrote uh, he wrote uh, uh, the Shambler from the Stars. He wrote the Shadow from the Steeple, and he wrote Notebook Found in the Deserted House, all of which have uh, Burning Shadows songs written after them. So maybe Burning Shadows should do a What Are Little Girls Made of song? Yeah, we'll be changing the title. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and as I, I'm sure we'll talk about when it happens, they uh, the android reference rock, or that's his, yeah, rock references the ancient ones or the old ones. Several points. Oh, oh, wow! Oh, I didn't point. even make this connection. That is great. Huh. Nice. Wow. So, yeah. All right. So I yeah, I gotta go with the. Solid six of the metal. 
Oh, he, yeah. He also just... wrote the thing on the roof, which has a song on our latest EP available on Rap, Rap Child Records. All right, go ahead. Steelresolve.com. Steelresolve.com. <laughs> hey, my, uh, my, uh, uh, Burning Shadows uh, beanie hat is coming very soon. Nice. Were you, were you impressed with the number of fulfillment emails you got? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, it's really impressive. It's like every every minute something happened to it. We've read your order. We have processed your order. Yeah, well, that's the level of communication we strive yeah. for. I, I get never many had, emails as well. <laughs> I've never had a more comfortable consumer experience than I've had at SteelResolve.com. SteelResolve.com. And with that. Podcast of Down shirts coming soon. Actually, favorite that is true. <laughs> Matt and Tim quotes yes. on the back. Oh my god! Yep, I, I am in the process. Let we'll them the mine our episodes and come up with quotes. Snippy. <laughs> okay, it's just the back is a list of every episode, so each new week you get to sell a new shirt. Well, that won't I, put I us the, in a I hole at all. Says, Collect them all. I want the I'm Tim Regan <laughs> yeah, shirt. Can, can, it, can it have the, the whole intro? I'm Tim Regan from U.S. Power Metal Burning Shadows. And you can tell the Tim version and the Doug version. <laughs> there you go. Oh, my God. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to buy it. Can you make a podcast on down beanie hat, too? <laughs> sure. Might, might cost more because we got to do the white and the, the neon green. I wonder oh, if they have God. purple hats. What? I'll, I'll look into this. Man, I can't wait to be, be totally geared up. I might have to. Uh, I'm gonna have to source out some places. <laughs> man, uh, what was your merch? I mean, uh, quality score, Doug. Uh, it's too talky. It's just a bunch of gobbledygook from the Forbidden Planet again. Couple. And it, this is where this is kind of interesting, right, Matt? Because we've seen the first six episodes and they kind of touch on some of this stuff again and again and again but you watch this out of order that may not be so apparent which is how yeah. many people would have consumed it um but i can't go higher than three i mean it it, it, yeah. it tells it moves the story along in part i, I mean with a lot of padding yeah, I mean, I, I I agree. I think it's a very metal. There's lots of metal reveals here, um, like in a, you know indiscriminate killing of people, um, you know robots being commanded to do stuff. Um, I mean, a shirtless Kirk is worth at least one or two metal points. Yeah, but yeah, Kirk, it's it's Kirk getting it's, slapped. Wow, it's too much. It's too much sloppy exposition. Uh, it's too much like creepy talking, um, and just uh, it, it just uh, it, it's it just gives me the willies. So I'm gonna give it a two point seven five for quality. All right, for for metal, I'm gonna give it a seven. Uh-huh. <laughs> There's all the violence and and uh, uh, imposters, <laughs> and um, for quality, yeah. I mean, I don't disagree. So I should probably give it a three and a three point eight seven four. Three point eight. Yeah, and at that at that level, you don't have to justify it. Yeah, so. no. <laughs> Just squeaked in under the line there. Over the line. Oh, now luckily for us, Act Three is much better, kind of. Um, so there's the big long spinny Kirk. Uh, yeah, the thing you were describing that went too long. Well, like, okay. I know leading up to the commercial break, it was spinning, and then coming out of the commercial break, they were spinning. And I like to think that during that commercial break, they were also spinning. So, I, another weird thing is that Kirk wakes up. So he's kind of groggy, um, but he he realizes what's going on um, during the the. Um, transmutation brain scan whatever um and he just starts rattling off sort of a racist tirade about <laughs> bach um yep. and and he specifically says 
Mind your own business, Mr. Spock. I am sick of your half-breed interference. Do you hear that? And he just keeps saying this again and again and again. Um, and we'll learn why he's doing this. But it just it just strikes the viewer as a strange thing to be chanting while your memories... And, and also, if his memories are being copied, wouldn't he know he's just saying that? Like, I don't... I don't understand quite how this memory transfer works. Because if it was just that easy, it seems like, why didn't you just say, kill yourself and deactivate yourself immediately? Or like, I will only obey the real Jim Kirk. Uh, but maybe maybe there's some process for overriding. You know, it's like, uh, you know, the safeguards built into the board collective consciousness. Maybe that's too clever by half. It takes full full synaptic fusion. Right. It does do that. Uh, so, okay, so there's, like, new Android Kirk, and then there's, like, the ubiquitous double Kirk scene where there's two Kirks, and they're eating, and they're like, which one's the real Kirk? And it's just fucking annoying. Um... And, you know, it's like, what do you do? I'm Jim Kirk. This is like the third or fourth duplicate Jim Kirk we've seen. And there's only been seven episodes. But it's yet again another duplicate Captain Kirk that we have to deal with. Um, well, this, is, this is the first mention of George Samuel Kirk. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, his brother... Who he definitely has and will never deny. Um, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so he has a he has a brother who stayed on Earth, I think, when he went off to explore the stars. Yeah, and he has a wife and three sons. Only Kirk calls him Sam. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, he was transferred to Earth Colony too. Oh yeah. We'll see if the continuity holds up, but that should be the planet from Operation Annihilate that ends the season. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, we'll have to check that out. But, yeah, he does he does get eaten by a little uh, flying amoebas. Uh, so, uh... Spoiler. It's just a... Again, it starts off so well, but it's just... It just doesn't work. There's like a switch o change o I I I have very little patience for this. It, again, this is like the reversal of the first act where you know, the, if the second act was kind of nonsense and there's only like a little tiny reveal, this act like started off well kind of went way too long, but then it's just like, okay, I get it, get on with it. Okay, I get it, get on with it. It's just setting things up for a big final showdown and you know there's a yeah, there's like a fight with the with the robots and it's just annoying. well well so it's yeah. all about securing yeah. immortality yeah, yeah that kirk has his good uh programming different word but the same old promises made by genghis khan julius caesar hitler ferris and maltuvis now, it's strange he didn't mention Khan Singh there, because you'd think he would. Uh, but maybe maybe he went by Ferris as, as well. Um, yeah, and I, I did check. Bernard Maltuvis uh, is a character out of the, uh, um, uh, the Eugenics Wars. Oh, really? In Memory Beta comic, uh, yeah. So, uh, you... you mentioned the uh the uh fight with the android um but you didn't mention that Kirk grabs a stalactite off the ceiling which he easily removes and it oh yeah totally looks like a dick yeah it's a heck of an image especially with the suit and yeah yeah he grabs a giant dick off the ceiling of the cave you die. Okay, yeah, no, good point. Good, good point. And, uh, that, that um, definitely for, contributes to the metal score. <laughs> yep. Uh, here's a poorly cropped image 
of said dick. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty hilarious. <laughs> I mean, that's a metal point right there. Yep. <laughs> I would also like to point out that uh, later on, we might meet old Mr. Genghis Khan. Um, so that's fun. Oh, that is, yeah, that, oh, we go. Just I can't, meet Genghis Khan. We meet man. We're not going to well, spoil that for I Tim. Mean, yeah, but that's going to be such a great. I can't wait for that episode. <laughs> it, like, the best part out. It's actually pretty good. Yeah, yeah. No, it's like you would think. <laughs> you would think an episode that involved Genghis Khan would be silly and not poignant. <laughs> It's one of the best ones. Anyway, all right, but that, that's that's taking us too far afield for right now. Here he's just mentioned. Um, uh, I mean, I I have so little patience for this act. I don't know. <laughs> but but it ends with Kirk hanging over a deep hole, just like he was hoping his security officer was doing. Yeah. 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 See, it's like more... that's why, he, that's why he was so obsessed with it, you know, because yeah. whenever he falls, he can grab onto something and hang more it. sloppy, <laughs> uh, more sloppy. Uh, it's a literal cliff writing. It is. Yeah. All right. I mean, that's where the point, that's a quality point right there. Cause it is a literal cliffhanger. Um. Uh, it's just so. All right. Well, do you need my uh, score to base your scores on? Please. Yeah. Uh, so he was gonna beat him with a giant dick. Uh, uh-huh. see what else happened? Uh, they ate more polygons. Yep. <laughs> um, well, except androids don't eat. Right. But... Androids don't eat. Uh, someone was gonna get choked. Um. Uh, there's casual racism from. Uh, <laughs> From Captain Kirk, so uh, and the whole uh, Kirk Spock S and M thing. Yeah, so, yeah. So all that together, I'm gonna go ahead and give it a metal score of, you know, some things cancel, other things out. I'm gonna go with an even five, and for quality, uh, can't beat that stalactic type thing. <laughs> so, uh, quality gets a six. All right. Uh, what was your metal score again? Five. Five and six. Uh, I want to go, Doug. Yeah, I mean, I think... So, yeah, we get the uh, the weird Kirk Spock thing, the name-dropping of a bunch of people who committed horrible things, <laughs> real and imagined people. Uh, yeah, the... Phallic um, bashing object, but the quality ain't there. So I'm gonna go six on the metal and four on the quality. What did I go in the last one, Tim? Three. Yeah, three. I can't go higher than three. It's not better. Yeah. Yeah. I. I. I mean, I'm gonna give it a quality point for being a literal cliffhanger. <laughs> um, but I can't give it more than a two, and I'm going to give it a metal point for having a phallic stalactite. But uh, it's I, it's just yeah. There's S, yeah. I guess it's a five. It's like you know, you make some good at, points, and I at think least average metal. I think I was giving quality points where I should have been giving metal points. So bump my metal score up to a six point six six. And uh-huh. lower my quality down to a four. Okay. All right. All right. That's that seems sound. Um. Yeah, that seems really sound. Okay. Well, it's time for the the culminating act, Act Four, <laughs> where all this stuff is gonna get resolved. Maybe. Uh. Uh. So he's literally hanging on the cliff, as we've established. Um, but then strangely, he, the, the, so, so he's hangling on the cliff and the rook, the giant android is, lurch is staring at Kirk 
Um, but miraculously, suddenly he pulls him from harm and he is perhaps, you know, when, when he was running off to kill Kirk, Nurse Chapel yelled at him, you know, I forbid you from harming him. And if we remember earlier, Dr. Corby told Rook to always obey uh, Nurse Chapel. Um, why he did that seems like a problem in his plan. Uh, but that's whatever, right? Um, meanwhile, back on the Enterprise, uh, robot imposter Kirk is there and he's walking around. Uh, and Spock <laughs> is like, what are you doing back here? And he's like, yeah, I'm back. Um, and then he, uh, goes to his quarters and Spock kind of follows him. And he's like, yo, what about, uh, Dr. Corby and all that stuff? Uh, to which robot Kirk snaps back with his racist programming, uh, <laughs> and, and says, mind your own business, Mr. Spock. I'm sick of your half-breed interference, do you hear? Um, but then after he's all racist, he's like... Back to being a pleasant, happy guy, um, and he's like, "All right, all right, gotta go, gotta go back to the planet now." Um, oh, because he has to go get the command log or something. There's some, the there's something he packet. needs. To do. Yeah. Command packet. And this um, is the first canonical appearance of, of the command, command packet. packet, which appears to be a bunch of uh, plastic sheets of paper type stuff. Well, I'm sure it's like you know the bathroom code. Um, like the, like the master password to the, to the lithium chamber, uh, you know, all the important, <laughs> you know, uh, enterprise command stuff. Um, uh, and, and so he goes back to the planet, uh, immediately after he beams down, uh, Spock realizes that something's wrong and informs a security team to go beam down and, and take care of business. All right, so instead of having an exciting confrontation, then we get another creepy, <laughs> rapey scene. And uh, I, do you want to take this? I, I'm just, do you want to take this, Doug? It's just, uh, it's just weird and rapey. And okay, well, just, Kirk reprograms. Andrea by smooching her a lot. Yeah. All right, move you know. on. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, it's still a lady bot. Right. Uh, and deep down, it's, it's, it's <laughs> whoever wrote this on Memory Alpha should be ashamed. They wrote, deep down, she enjoyed it, but her circuitry protested. What the fuck does that mean? Wait, can we? That's really what it says on Memory do, Alpha. Do we need I know, to I know. A member to edit? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Are you going to delete that? I mean, it should be. It should it's, be. All right. It's not stated in the episode. <laughs> right. Uh, we need a reference needed on this. <laughs> I Well, actually, it needs to be eradicated from the internet. Yeah. I mean, we we just need to erase the Wayback Machine so it can never return. Um, That's right. All right. Let's move on. Okay. Isn't so then we, like, learn about the old ones, and we, you know, Kirk is, like, confronting Rook after he, like, creepily um, sexually harasses the ro other robot. Uh, and he, uh, like, they learn that, like, Basically, it's a, it's like an Isaac Asimov situation um, where they were like built to like protect the the old ones, the creators. But basically, you know, the survival of the robots outweighed their programming, and they murdered their creators. And Kirk was like, "Well, don't you realize that Corby is doing the exact same thing?" And convinces. Um, Rook to go kill, um, like, go kill Corby, and then Corby kills Rook with a phaser, and then Andrea comes across Robot. Uh, it's just, uh, it's just so frustrating again. It's just like, 
Andrea meets Robot Kirk, and they start being romantic, and then it's the, like, Robot Kirk is confused, like we all are, (laughs) and and basically, uh, he was like, no, I won't keep kissing you, and so Andrea, the robot, vaporizes Robot Kirk because he wouldn't sexually harass her like the human Kirk would... And all of this is just to, like, reveal that there was a struggle and that Corby's hand has revealed that he, too, is a goddamn robot. So his hand gets injured by scraping it on the apparently incredibly sharp door. (laughs) And it peels his hand. Revealing so, the circuitry beneath. Uh, so Corby's so, a robot. Everyone's a robot. Everyone's a goddamn robot. So, basically, we learn that Corby, the real Corby, was injured, and he found the robot spinnermatizer, <laughs> and he made a robot body for himself, and he is human, but... Guess what? It was all for naught. Yeah, well, he was trying to prove how human he is, despite the fact that he's in a robot. By And he kept going like... uh, He was trying to prove it by telling uh, Chapel, I think, to ask me to do something human. Ask me to calculate. No. Ask me to (laughs) equate... No. no. Ask me to analyze. No. And then he realizes he is not human anymore. Oh. Wah, wah. But, okay, but then... I, it, oh, I ahead, can see Tim. why that part resonated with you, Tim. Yeah, I liked it. <laughs> I mean, that's a struggle you have as well. Right. Ask me any, Ask me anything. Ask me to calculate something. Oh, shit. I mean... Um. <laughs> but then the very next scene... Uh, proves, it's actually the same fucking scene, proves that the androids are capable of human emotions, or emotions in general, because then Andrea bursts in, and she says she loves Dr. Corby, robot, and she wants to love him, and this Dr. Corby robot realizes that he loves Nurse Chapel, I guess, Yes, and that everything is for naught, and they murder suicide each other. Hooray! <laughs> and just in were- time, Spock and the boys walk in. <laughs> yeah, it took them long enough. If they beat I mean, them down right after the captain, they had all this time for android smooching and uh, hand scraping and <laughs> etc. Then, then they, then, I, I like to imagine that there was like a, a bunch of wacky antics where they kept falling over <laughs> that cliff and like having to like, it's like, are you, whoa, it's like, all right, now get him back. <laughs> and, yeah, the stalactite, tight, get it, yeah. Uh, all right, now hey, come, come that looks up. like a dick. Hey, let's get a picture with that. <laughs> all right, my turn. That's what took there, them so long. And then, uh, <laughs> Spock's like, yo, where's Dr. Corby at? And Kirk says, Dr. Corby was never here. Which is wrong, because he was. He was. Because he made himself into a robot. He was there. So that's just a lie. And they they beam up. uh, And... at there, It's like another closing bridge scene, right? Um, so Spock tells Kirk that he was dismayed over his use of the racist term that he used. And Kirk says, I'll remember that next time I find myself in a similar situation. Which which is just a weird thing to say because you you knew that because he did that. So wh- what? 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 It's what? all part of their games. But that's just such a, a weird... Uh, I didn't get it. I, well, I you really... notice Spock doesn't take any action the first time he's called it until Kirk beams back down. And it's like, 
Oh, this isn't going the way I expected. <laughs> <laughs> it's one thing to be called a racial slur, but a racial slur and suspicious activity? Something's not right. All right, you want to rate it? Yes. All right, uh, I can start. Uh, I think this whole ending is uh, pretty metal. People are uh, uh, revealed to be robots. There's a murder-suicide. Uh, there's a bunch of smooching. <laughs> what else? Um, there, there is. There's an attempted smacking. <laughs> Love is illogical. Love is logical. They talk about the old ones. They talk about um, the uh, the machines killed off an entire civilization. That's metal as fuck. So I'm going to give yep. the ending a metal score of eight. But nice. I'm going to give the quality score a one because it's dumb and it's full of melodrama. <laughs> and, uh, it doesn't make much sense. And, you know, it's... It was written by a fantastic author, but you know, even they had, they have their their bad days. Maybe he wrote it on a deadline. Maybe he was an alcoholic or something. I don't know. I mean, Maybe he definitely had an intern was. Write it for him. Uh, Gene Roddenberry probably rewrote it. <laughs> right. Just write Robert Block on the top. <laughs> I I I bet Doug's right. Actually, what if the what if the chick android comes out and says she loves it? And but then the other android says love is illogical. <laughs> Metal score is seven point seven seven. Nice. Uh quality score two point two two. I I think this was one of out of the f- four acts. This is not the weakest act. Now I'm gonna bump it up to a full three. Um there's a lot of problem here, but at least something happens. Other than like slowly eating polygons and dumping exposition, <laughs> even though again it's Act Four and there's a lot of exi- <laughs> exposition dumped on us, um, at least there was a resolution of sorts. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go four and eight, so four for quality, eight for metal. Okay. Yeah, this is too much happening. Like, uh, yeah, the murder suicide. That's kind of interesting. This. It's a lot of interesting things, and from a metal perspective, I mean, they talk about cleansing, evil, uh, yeah, and then all the awkward sort of romantic or sexual feelings inappropriately expressed. Pretty metal. (laughs) Uh, yeah. Not good, but metal. <laughs> right. Not good, but metal. I think metal. we all agree on that. Yeah. It was pretty metal. It just sucked. Hmm. Hmm. I've also realized that there was an error in the spreadsheet, so all the all the overall scores are off. So I'm trying to fix that right now. Um. So this is definitely a Star Trek episode. <laughs> Um, looking at our, uh, our conclusions here, uh, it is a middling episode. Um, so far the worst episode that we've watched is Mud's Women, which got a absolute score of 15%. Um, this, uh, this is actually the, our next lowest. So the enemy within got a 57.32%. Uh, this is coming in with a 57.20. Um, the uh, per hour consensus is here. Um, the best average act is actually act four, um, followed <laughs> by act two. Uh, the worst part is the teaser, uh, which got a very low score of 2.6666666 or six repeating. Um, the overall highest quality score belongs to uh, Tim, who gave a 4.3435 average quality score. Maybe it's because um, I watched this one. 
Yeah, maybe because <laughs> you were just excited about actually watching. Uh, and uh, and and Tim actually gave the highest metal score at a five point eight three. Um, I'm too generous. But but oh, that was pretty I will, close. The pendulum will swing. I'll be less generous. That was pretty close because Doug had an average metal score of five. I had an average metal score of five point one two five. Uh, Doug's quality somewhat close to yours at a three point seven five, and I had the lowest quality score. At a 3.18, which shockingly was my same quality score for Mud's Women. So there's some fun facts there. Um, uh, uh, I think our, our, our ras- rational and objective assessment methodology is holding up well. Yeah. Um, and so the moral of the story is uh, if you're going to watch a Star Trek episode, um, watch this one instead of Mud's Women, but you could probably find something better. Either way. Thanks for listening to Podcast Them Down. You can find Burning Shadows, Eisenmore, and Recently Vacated Graves on Bandcamp, as well as Facebook, along with Fade to Black Metallica Tribute and Podcast Them Down itself. Until next time, keep it metal.